Well, I, for the uh, after lunch speaker on the second day of the conference, I think Tony kept you fairly well engaged and I think he managed to provoke and even offend some of you. So congratulations, Tony, and th thank, th thank Tony very much for his presentation. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Robin Alders, who started her professional life as a vet. 30 years ago, she began working in developing nations in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, setting up infectious disease uh, controls in animals in rural areas, which was an important part of food security and poverty alleviation. She's much publicized and lauded, and Robin was awarded the Kerr Stephen Medal by the Australian College of Veterinary Scientists for her work. She was also the inaugural recipient of the Mitchell Global Humanitarian Award. She now runs a merino sheep farm in the Southern Tablelands. Please welcome Robin. Thanks very much, Sandra, and hello to you all. Thanks. I should um, thank Julian, Bob, my colleagues at the Council for the Human Future. I think it was thanks to you that I got the gig today. And I should confess, I do love to present myself as a merino sheep farmer. And I can say that because my brother really is. So I have somebody who knows what they're doing, who, uh, who looks after me. My interest in infectious disease control has always been about food security, and particularly for the most vulnerable members of family. Um, and, but the title today is Valuing Food. Um, uh, Tony, and thanks for a great talk, mentioned economics. And if we don't fix our economic system, we're not going to figure our way um, out of the conundrum that we find ourselves in. I would also like to thank Professor Mortimer. Shane, wonderful welcome to country. It is amazing that you do continue to welcome us. And I'd like to acknowledge all folk of Ngambi, um, peoples, past, present and uh, future. Thank you for allowing us to be here. So these are, yeah, my dual passions. I've spent over, you know, close to 30 years working with village chickens, indigenous birds, and I work with them and their owners. Really important, particularly for women, and uh, yes, my passion, I've come back to Australia, the village chickens of Australia, the merino sheep. Everywhere you look, you're generally going to find some. And they're on Gundungara country um, to the north of, of Crookwall. So this is a great uh, picture and it reminds me of the journey that uh, has happened while I've been growing up. When I first started this work, we all talked about food security. Now we talk about food and nutrition security. What's the point of growing food if it's not going to nourish you or harvest food if it's not going to nourish you? I love this photo, these uh, children, and you can see the young boy at the front here in, in central Tanzania has got some white powder on his hand, not the sort of white powder you see in Sydney or possibly here in Canberra. But this is from the fruit of the baobab tree, very high in vitamin C, like having sherbet. It's wonderful. And unfortunately, in most of the work that I do, talking about food and nutrition security, indigenous plants and animals are very rarely mentioned, but they are important and they are highly nutritious. So this is the, the definition has just grows every year. It gets longer and longer. Um, this is our current definition from 2012 that explains what we expect um, if we're going to deliver food and nutrition security. We've seen this image before. I apologize to the men. It could equally be any other gender represented here. We've all, we've all got uh, this problem. So here we are in Australia. We love to talk about being the breadbasket of the region, how many millions of people we can feed, but we're not even doing a good job here at home. So we have a growing population in many ways, not only in number, but in size, and it's a problem. And we're seeing it now occurring in our youngsters and in our adolescents. It's costing us a lot of money. We know the pressure on our health systems and what that means for other sectors that have to get a bite of that, that national budget. Particularly in women of reproductive age, we have a problem with anemia. 
I like to think that if men menstruated, we'd actually do something about it. Yeah, it's amazing for me. Very few animal species menstruate. Maybe that's part of the problem for our nutritionists. Rats don't menstruate. Mice don't menstruate. So it does, it's not reflected in our animal models for nutrition. But it's a serious problem. And women are constantly fatigued before. They keep on going, but a lot of them have a problem because they're not getting enough iron in their diet. Sadly, people who are overbeast uh, who are obese or overweight often are deficient in micronutrients. So they're getting a lot of calories, but they're not getting that quality nutrition, those nutrients that they need for them to have a healthy life. Partly for this reason, this is um, people between 18 and 24%, on average, 40% of their diet is junk food. That's an average. So that's telling you that some people are eating a lot more than that, which is really a great worry. We know that food insecurity is growing in Australia. It was a problem before COVID. It's now a huge problem. And the other factor that we have to take into account is where we are. We just saw that magnificent map of rangelands in Australia. Rangelands is not where you crop. We have very little land that was suitable for cropping. Most of it, or a lot of it, now has houses built on it. So we don't have a lot of land. We need to think, and we're different. In the US, they've got 19% arable land. So that the diet that's going to be sustainable for them is going to look different to the diet that might be sustainable for us. So economics, um, as I did my PhD here at ANU, I shared a house with three economists. We're all still friends and we're all still arguing. But this is economics. So you can spend $3 and get two litres of milk. You can spend $2.40 and get two litres of cola. This is what the serving suggests, what, what the nutritional information is. How many people look at nutrient information when they buy food? Yo, <laughs> fabulous audience. When you divide that by a dollar, what are you getting? So let's, uh, yeah, pretty equal in terms of energy. But let's skip down. Let's have a look at protein, getting quite a bit of protein in terms of your daily requirements from milk and have a look at calcium. This is critically important for children, critically important for women of reproductive age, very important, insufficiently discussed. But what goes off the shelf, 60 cents cheaper, is cola. This is our report card for the Sustainable Development Goals. I travel internationally. People are very familiar with Sustainable Development Goals, and I know in this audience you're all familiar with them. They are very rarely discussed in the wider Australian community. I've not heard them discussed in relation to our yet-to-be-called federal election. This is our report card. What you can see is we're on track for some things. The two things that I'd like to talk about are the Sustainable Development Goal 2, looking at zero hunger, which includes not only agriculture, but also includes nutrition. So that's why number three, which is all about human health, is looking so good, because it's not talking about human nutrition. That's included in two. And looking at 12, which is about responsible production and consumption. Very, very important. This is the global report card um, looking at sus sustainable production and consumption. And I'd like to draw your attention to two countries. That first image with the, the lovely uh, women and their village chickens, that was in Mozambique. They're getting a green on sustainable production and consumption. It's a different way of looking at things, isn't it? But Australia, we're not doing so well. So let's have a, a closer look once again within uh, the realms of what we know. So we've been talking a little bit about circular economies. There's a lot of talk about bioeconomies. But just having a bioeconomy doesn't mean that it's sustainable. You can have a bioeconomy that's linear, where you've got what you're producing and you're um, having it sold, consumed, and waste. And it can be totally linear, and it's not really contributing um, to a circular economy. If we want to move on and talk about sustainable and circular bioeconomies, these two adjectives are very important. 
what we know is we want that circular motion. We want recycling of nutrients, recycling of all important uh, ingredients. So let's go back and have a look at our two countries now. Let's start in Mozambique and look at village chickens. So this is a, the um, uh, very stylized uh, bioeconomy for village chicks. You get your young chicks, some of them that evade predators, whatever, they grow into growers and then go on for the adults to be hens and roosters. And what's important, uh, and a little bit, I was so pleased to see Tony's presentation. He talks about giving um, some of his products to his neighbours. Social cohesion is very important, and village chickens are part of that. When you have a special guest, the bird either gets to go live with that guest or it gets consumed, but that's critically important, and you can't put a price on it. That's what holds these communities together and builds those bridges. You can either slaughter those animals and have meat, the hens can lay eggs, and then you get the next generation coming along. We have a look at my Merino sheep farm. We get some lovely lambs, we'll have wieners, and we'll have ewes, rams, and weathers. And mostly when we talk about Merino sheep, we're thinking about wool. But in terms of our economy, where does our wool go? It's all virtually all exported. Most of it is exported to China, and then it will go on to various places where it's turned into a range of products. But is wool the only product from these sheep? No. Fascinating. Um, some of them, particularly the young males, might, might be sold, um, but only some of those will be consumed here in Australia. Then we get the older sheep who have given us lovely sustainable fibre over their lives. But what happens to that sheep at the end of his or her life? Um, you'll see mutton and offal, almost all of it is exported. We used to eat a lot of mutton, but then after the Second World War, when the mutton went to the troops and Australians were encouraged to eat lamb, now we've switched to eating lamb. And the average cons um, consumption of mutton in Australia is now the equivalent of one serve. 300 grams a year is what the Australian average is for mutton. For offal, the most nutrient dense in terms of iron, zinc, selenium, vitamin A, we don't eat it at all. It goes to our obese pets or it's all exported. So it's a little bit of a tricky problem uh, in terms of how we're using produce to get multiple outcomes, including our own nutrition. So where in Mozambique, we may have a circular bioeconomy. In Australia, we're not quite there yet. So this brings me um, to dietary guidelines. Um, can I ask how many people here work within the human health sector? That's encouraging. More of you than I thought. So our current Australian dietary guidelines, the, the current version were um, released in 2013. There's absolutely no mention of sustainability. And the foods that are mentioned there are based on those that are regularly consumed. There's no mention of what we could consider consuming that's nutritious, that's available, that may help us to, to close that circle. It's what we do eat. If we take a look at the Chinese dietary guidelines, they have a, a, a section on sustainability. There are many countries now increasingly looking at sustainability and they are encouraging that elimination of waste and having um, an ethos of diet civilization. Not sure how that translation worked, but I'm sure you get the concept. So the Australian di uh, dietary guidelines are under review right now. I would encourage all of you to engage with that process. This is critically important for our health, and for the health of our nation. And at last, the World Bank, I agree with them. It's taken a while. I, I normally haven't, I've had a bit of a tricky relationship with some of the World Bank um, activities, but they recognize and have said very clearly that food systems must change rapidly and fundamentally to become more regenerative resilient and inclusive while increasing food supply for an additional 2 billion people by 2050. I agree with them. I'm sure they'll be relieved. 
The important figure really is that today's food system generate 12 trillion in hidden social, economic and environmental costs. Now that's a lot of money and it might get some governments thinking. They've gone on to propose five things that really, really need to be done. So let's have a look at what they are. Five imperatives. So you have to reshape public support and incentives. And it's no news to you that our current food systems incentivize unsustainable choices. They've got recommendations as to what we need to do, how we need to change that regulatory environment. Is there anybody here who works with government who could action this? Oh, not today. Okay. I've added one thing there, you know, I, I, I'm, and I'm sure some folk within the, the World Bank, and it is, it's the World Bank, it's the International Food Policy Research Institute and uh, the land, uh, Food and Land Use Coalition that put this document together. But I think that any system has to look at natural nutrient density in the foods because it's not just about the nutrients you know. There are certain elements in food and food-based approaches to diet that we don't yet understand, but we know that by having those nutrients presented in food rather than as a pill, um, make a big difference. And that we need public spending um, to create mechanisms for others to invest in nature conservation. This paper, and there have been other work by CSIRO showing that our addiction to junk food is not just bad for our health. It's contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So it's bad, bad, and we have to really address it. In terms of integration, our food sector, as we've seen from our recent series from the bushfires to COVID to the floods, our food supply system is precarious, and that's been seen across the globe. Congratulations to ASEAN countries who, after the global food crisis, really worked together. So with COVID, we didn't see a, a big jump in rice prices, and that was because of their coordinated action at the level of their regional economic community. So it can be done. Other things that we need to do is change how we measure risks so that we take into account all risks, not just immediate short-term uh, economic risks. And... Uh, the sustainable business, oh, I can't remember who they are, but there's a global group that works about sustainable um, economics. They've set up two task force looking at climate related financial disclosures and nature related financial disclosures. We need to be engaging with them. We need our treasury to be engaging with them. And we need to be part of that change to change our, the economic system that governs our lives. Last one here, once again, who's from government? Um, we need to coordinate across department. They do need to talk to each other. Scale, fit for purpose, financial products and business models. We've talked a little bit. We've had a lot of ideas. And as a former academic, we love to have ideas. We're just not very good at making them feasible or implementable. And it's those transaction costs. So it depends what you come up with. Is it going to be feasible? And how can you make people make those changes while our economic system is also transitioning because it's not there yet? But once again, a range of things that can be used and having finance institutions but at the national, regional and international level that are able to use their capital as drivers to support these changes that we need. Uh, we need to have um, to take into account and value sustainable practices. So how is it here in Australia that those farmers that have led the discussion have demonstrated to us that it's possible? How can they be truly rewarded um, and, and then have that as an incentive for other farmers to make that, that shift? Secure, equitable food systems really important. Once again, we're seeing growing inequity in Australia. It is shocking the levels of people who now need to seek assistance in order to be able to, to feed their families. There are things that can be done to, uh, deliver, to deliver 
equitable food systems, both within and, and uh, uh, between countries, looking at social protection systems across the society, and food is a crucial part of that. And for companies, fair work, fair reward for, for work done, absolutely, and to enable people and producers, farmers and producers, to maintain their livelihoods and invest to improve sustainability and to be the stewards they want to be on their land. Strengthening food governance, part of the discussion. And once again, I hope, where are those non-existent government representatives? I do hope that we're engaging with this process. It is incredibly important. Things that can be done. Now, this is interesting that this group has suggested that we need a new body to coordinate it. Um, they agreed with that idea. There was a lot of pushback. Um, many feel that it should be possibly that the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations could be reimagined and realigned to drive this process. But somebody's going to drive it, and we should be part of that discussion as to how it's organized. Um, and certainly to reform trade barriers and to get uh, investment in infrastructure in underserved areas, it's almost like this was written for Australia, isn't it? Yeah. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I commend to you a, an article that we wrote a couple of years ago that talks about One Health, Zero Hunger. One Health is a, an all-encompassing uh, interdisciplinary intersectoral approach that tries to get people to think along systems line. Uh, for Here in Australia, I think about One Health dreaming because I have a feeling we don't need the term One Health here. We have another concept that's uh, been here for several thousand years that could help us in this journey. But fundamentally, thank you for your time and we absolutely do need to work together. Thank you, Robin. Um, we have time for one question. Is somebody? On your award, and uh, I too also acknowledge the uh, allodial title rights that uh, Shane Mortimer and the Nambi tribe have in our region. My question is um, about Africa and how you helped household to household. And I'm just wondering, I mean, if you could do that to Africa, then why can't we do it to Australia? Like I'm thinking, if you're saying that someone in that family group that drove the actual progress, then surely a similar structure would actually exist in Australia. And surely things just can't be driven by the bottom line. There's gotta be something behind the spirit of a human being that says, let's just do something about this? It's a good question, isn't it? And, uh, you know, people say, why do you go and work in Africa? And I say, because it's too hard to work in Australia. <laughs> that, that was, uh, it's true. It is absolutely uh, true. Um, we, you know, at the time that I left Australia, youth suicide in rural areas was a problem. Today, it's an epidemic. We haven't solved that problem. We've got many here. The work that I did in Africa, I think my most important qualification was having um, been born and raised on a farm because I, I worked with the farmers and I believed that they would contribute. So uh, before our work, all of the vaccination programs for livestock was all given away free to these poor farmers. Our system was to work with them. And once they saw that it worked, they contributed. So it's ongoing because it's theirs. Uh, so my, uh, once again, my advice to the government people who aren't here um, would be to listen to farmers in Australia. Thanks. Yeah.